So here we are supposed to speculate. So I anyway I do it all, all my lectures are speculative. So this would be kind of double speculation. So you must be ready for that. Don't complain, yeah? And uh, so, so I, I want to emphasize, of course, I cannot talk about this all the time, the questioning in, in, my, in mathematics. And um, so the, the point, yes, you know, there is this citation, the, the dictum of Socrates saying that you know you know nothing. It's certainly impossible to understand what the meaning is, but the possible interpretation is that you must be focused in trying to realize what you don't understand, yeah? So I have to have a mechanism of asking questions, which is not so easy because, uh, as we know from ex ex experiments in psychology, if you brought, bring up kitten who only see horizontal lines, and they go outside, they don't see vertical lines. They're stuck into the, uh, into the, you know, the vertical objects, yeah? And so we are exactly brought up this way, yeah? We only can see what we are supposed to see. And what we're not supposed to see, we're just blind to that, yeah? And so the question is how to break it and just, so I'll give some instances in the history when people saw something and sometimes it was efficient and so we're asking good questions and well, some questions happen to be not so good, apparently. And so I, I look at some particular subject and so I'll be speaking about geometry so I'll concentrate on the most, most uh, visual part of the geometry. Of course geometry has many aspects and you can ask questions on different levels. So just visually what you can realistically observe when you can ask questions. And again, the, the, the problem is that our visual system works in such a way you only can see what you're supposed to see even just in the real world, yeah? So if some person just moves in a slightly different way, it becomes invisible. Yeah, you know this, yeah? <laughs> so yes, it's only very canonical patterns which we can see. And even though they are apparently simple, well, we don't see. So I will think mostly about a geometry of metric spaces, so when you have a distance, and I don't know, of course, the history. I don't pretend to say something about history, so my historical uh, statements will be just, shouldn't be taken seriously historical, yeah, it's just uh, mathematical folklore. And the first, at least in my knowledge, where the metric appears, the object not only attached to the Euclidean space, of course, when it comes to the Euclidean space, the metric was discussed already, you know, Zenon paradoxes, whatever. Extensively, they were trying to understand if topology of the space forces the metric. Yeah, there's a lot of the discussion with Zenon like that. But the metric for non-Euclidean situation, I think, appeared first in the Gauss work on surfaces, yeah? So, is it true? Maybe somebody may know better. So you look at the surface in the three space, and you start thinking what you deform the surface in the piece of paper, right? And then something doesn't change, and the something is the distance, but not as measured in the ambient space by straight line, but by the minimal shortest curve inside of the surface. So this was a, for all I know, again, was the first instance when people, um, Gauss kind of brought up this new conception. I don't know how he articulated that. That you might have a space, and kind of a, a simple-minded geometric space, when there is a distance function attached to this, which is just find the triangle inequality. Right, so you have function two variables, right, and you know, this say ABC property that C is bigger than A. A plus B. And by the way, here, and uh, I come to that, you immediately may ask a question because, so this is a function to variables, which must satisfy this condition. Hmm? What is R? Real value of condition. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so what, is in, in satisfying the triangle inequality? And of course, the immediate question which appears, and this is just often, we meet this question, how we can find such a function? Yeah, it's quite difficult, actually. You have function two variables, you must satisfy this condition. If you just think about for your function two variables, write it down by formula, right? You, you'll be in trouble. Then to proving it, always satisfy this condition. And this would be one of the, it's not kind of, it's not just checking something as positive or not, yeah? It must be true for all pairs of points, yeah? It's not, and uh, again, we, we, I shall come to that, yeah? This is one of the general issues about generating objects which will have it, yeah? They, they come in this example, but in general not. And so they need this deformation. And then <coughs> that 
And so, and so I guess the question which Gauss could have asked. So now we have one surface here and another surface there. And of course, in this Euclidean space, you can see the other yeah, they're different. You know, you have this arc and this arc. But internally, they have the same length as arc, so they're the same. How you can tell the two metrics are different? They're not kind of can be matched one to another. And so with respect to this internal distance, they will be indistinguishable. Right? If we leave inside of the surface, we would not, wouldn't know the difference. And, um, and then he introduced curvature. And uh, in an extremely ingenious way, which we, just, this cannot come out of simple questioning. This was a, a, a mathematical point. So you look at the union sphere, and you take this normal vectors to one surface and normal vectors to another surface. Unit normal vectors, and so it maps here, and this also maps over there. And uh, this map, so has a Jacobian, but how much it distorts area, yeah? So we take a tiny little element of area here, and have tiny little element of here, and there is some ratio between here, and you do the same there, there is another ratio there, so the Jacobian of the map, and so he observes the Jacobian of this Gauss map does not change when you deform the surface, yeah? so it's intrinsic characteristic. So it's defined, again, in the Euclidean terms, but a posteriori, it happens to be invariant. Yeah, that's certainly extremely simple way to, in, way to prove, but extremely, I think, uh, you know, it's impossible to guess if you don't know that. Yeah? I just wonder is just, uh, if ever such questions will ask people who don't know that, like students, if they can tell the two surfaces are different and they, they can reinvent the Gauss map. Yes. Because you see, it's very difficult to evaluate, the, very uh, impossible to evaluate kind of the difficulty of making such a, uh, such a uh, conjecture. For me, it looks it's impossible. It might be a genius to make such a guess. Yeah? But maybe it's not so. Well, this will actually, we, we don't have a mechanism of evaluating, evaluating this kind of a statement. But, OK. so. And in particular, so in this I'm kind of closer to what I want to talk about, more comes the, the crucial distinction between positive and negative curvature. So another kind of object which I, be, I believe, actually I don't know who first isolated this, this is convexity. Yeah? It's one of the big ideas in mathematics and starts from something very simple. You know this is convex, yeah, and this is not convex. And before you know any mathematics, of course, you know that somebody is convex and somebody is not convex. Right, yeah? Coming up with a definition is, and again, it's not that difficult. I think just, well, almost everybody with has mathematical elementary training, I mean, just on the very limited level, can work out a definition of convexity. However, again, it's not so easy. Once you isolate it, convex it, and you you see gotten convex objects, so it has convex ones. How you start asking questions about them? So as a mathematician, what you want to know about them? Yeah? And again, it's not that easy yeah, to ask a meaningful question. Well, they're convex, they solve that. So. But, but you know, it's not so. I mean, just, there are quite profound questions. One, just in a second, I say about the dimension two about surfaces. But, and I don't know if some of you will talk about that as we understand now. We tally kind of, you know, we may take more of that. The convexity, its power emerges only when dimension goes to infinity. Yeah? When dimension goes to infinity, then convexity really tells you more and more and more. And any fixed dimension, convexity tells you preciously little. Yeah? In a fixed dimension. I'm not aware of any really profound convex theorem which is already significant in small dimension. Of course, there are some results where I involve convexity, but they're kind of tangential. Again, you know, it's supposed to be pro 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 provocative. If somebody knows great theorem about convex state three-dimensional sets, I'm just sorry, what, uh, hmm? but, but it's a universal statement in all dimensions, yeah. But if it, but a real variety of shapes, yeah, in convexity appears only when dimension is large. Well, essentially, because in every fixed dimension, the space of convex sets up to proper normalization is compact, and certainly they're all kind of before you. In a way, you think you know them. It's, it's a question of computation. Though, as you know, computation may be formidable. Like, well, coming to question, 
there was this question of Kepler about optimal parting of spheres in the free space, and it was recently solved. And uh, yeah, you know, the, the best arrangement of spheres in free space is just periodic arrangement, and uh, which is specific for, for the free space. And uh, this is the, what do you think is a good or bad question, by the way? You're asking how many. Because it's not, but now somebody proved it, yes, so I cannot say it's just a junky question. Hmm? Do you think, yeah, again, we can say, well, because in the physics things are being arranged this way, this is what you mean. But is it really physicists with a sign under that? Yeah. Do you care? <laughs> Jorgen, do you care that, you can, that the best packing in the three spaces by, by round spheres? Where's Jorgen? Yeah. Because still, yeah, in physics you cannot prove it yeah, for, for realistic systems, yeah, and when, but crystallizing somebody, so you can't use the theorem, right? Uh, so is it of, of, of relevance for physics? I don't think it's okay. And I cannot just tell for physicists, yeah, or for biologists who crystallize proteins whether they care for them. I <coughs> Of course, yeah, this is in, 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 in mathematics, all the time, we're just between two dangers of triviality and irrelevancy, yeah? When you prove a very deep theorem, it be very easy to be irrelevant because it goes somewhere there, or it, or it may be okay, very relevant, like, like this theorem of Gauss, but I can, can imagine a modern mathematician being shy to publish it because it's so trivial, yeah? So... And certainly this thing about spheres is extremely kind of a difficult theorem, but you know, it looks to me relevant, yeah? I, mean, I don't know. Again, I want just opposite opinion, say it's really relevant. Yeah? Yeah. 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 About taste, yeah, again, it, it, when you say the matter of taste, you immediately kind of make further discussion impossible. I don't think there is such a thing as taste, yeah? Right? <laughs> so, we, I, actually, then we say what kind of criteria, what determines yeah, our, our orientation in mean, the matter of taste? I mean. <laughs> hmm? Yeah? No, of course, of course, yeah, no, what you, you know, I'm not saying about heaven in the future. Maybe 10 years from now, there will be something grand coming from that. I'm saying at the present moment. We cannot judge by the, you know, they use the standards of the future. But the present standard, yes, if you think about the theorem and what goes into that, yeah, it's just essentially computational, right? Or let's take more elementary question, how many balls you can surround a given ball, yeah? There was a discussion between Newton and somebody, I forgot whether 12 or 13. Yeah, it's purely a computational question, you know. You know even at that... Which one? No, no, but again, it's not computational, but it's reducible to computational result. And it's clear that there is a hierarchy of computational things which one of them will imply. Yeah, so it's quasi computation. So this is a systematic computer search which give you yes or no. It may go forever, but it's not. What's your view of the four-color theory? Yeah. What's your view of the four-color theory? No, no, I'm not supposed to I'm just asking questions, yeah? So I'm asking questions, you're answering them, yeah? So what is your view of the four-color theory? I think it's very similar. No, four color theorem is less computational, no? They, no, the reduction to computation there is non trivial, but for this case, it's always computational scheme to which they use it. Yeah, they're different than the structure. Okay. Uh, so, well, I was there, yeah? Okay, so we go about this convexity, yeah? Now, so comes the distinction of curvature. Yeah, so we have convex surfaces, and just, and we want to again to make a big thing out of them, just to extract something and generalize. Yeah, that's one of the way we make questions. And so, as Gauss discovered, there is convexity and there is this opposite case. It's not concavity, but being settled kind of surface. They always have difficulty of stitching. Yeah, and such as those, 
like about the map into the sphere, this kind of they don't change orientation of the map. So here is the surface, and here is the sphere, and this vectors kind of don't switch. But if you make this for the, this surface, yeah, there is switch of orientation. This oriented thing goes to the opposite oriented thing. Yeah. Well, it's not so easy to visualize, by the way. Yeah. Orientation, you know, is a tremendous mess. What is plus and what is minus, but believe me, there is a well attached sign to this map, and of course, you see it in the space. Saddle surface is very different from convex. And so, so in, in, intrinsically, the convex surfaces characterized by, by something being positive, some curvature being positive. Or the opposite thing is something being negative. And they're so very visually different. And then, Mm. Well, we want to we want want to make a it would be nice yeah to tame them. So I'm okay. <coughs> yeah, in yeah, in meanwhile, yeah, you may ask questions, yeah. You did it, yeah? <laughs> and so, so in the framework of abstract metric spaces, so how we can, can isolate this convexity? So what convexity means in the framework of the abstract, or these opposite things of, of not being convex? Or say hyperbolic, yeah, that's opposite case, it's a hyperbolicity. So, so there are two kinds of words, of course, I think it's pretty different question. One, convexity, which we kind of have visual image, pretty good one. And then another opposite hyperbolicity, which I think by far less clear in our mind, yeah? We see convexity recognizes, again, our visual system much better recognizing convexity rather than hyperbolicity. Easier to imagine convex than non convex So, and... Uh, for convexity, how you define convexity for general spaces. Of course, I will not give you the historical definition how it works, but just give you one of the recent elegant characterization of convexity. But so the objects are so the metric spaces with the distance, and at the surface, at the moment, I want to insist that the arc spaces, so for every two points, there is a middle point. So the distance here equal exactly half of the distance between two points, yeah? So this is this kind of metric. So you can always find intermediate point as the case for surfaces over. But whenever you get two points, distance measured with the shortest path between them. So we, we, uh, well this will be mostly space I'll be concerned with at this stage. Now, how we can define positive curvature? In general, and there was actually a long process, yeah, and uh, worked by many people, especially by Alexander, who actually recently died. Maybe we heard of this, yeah, Alexander, Alexander who uh, developed axiomatization of this conception. And but kind of the easiest, the shortest, kind of mathematically most conceptual definitions uh, uh, emerged rather uh, recently, and well, it's impossible to guess. What it is, it is as follows. So you have a symmetric space X, and convexity means the following, that if you take any Y instead of X, and you map it to any Euclidean space, well, from N maybe 1 and up to infinity, so I have a map F, and suppose that this Lipschitz of F less than 1, which means the map is distance decreasing. Right, so it makes distances smaller. Then it's extendable to some map here yeah, with the same property, also distance decreasing. It's logically very simple, yeah, but it still takes time to approach. If you speak about just functions and on any space, you can extend functions, Lipschitz function from uh, smaller set to bigger set by kind of trivial reasoning. <coughs> this property is true, and this is not trivial. If this is Euclidean space, yeah, if you put here Euclidean space itself, and this is Kirs, I, I cannot remember the Kirsbaum, oh. Kirsbaum, yeah, Kirsbaum theorem or something. The 
geproefde dus, ja. Dat is een already a theorem saying that if a Euclidean space you take any subset and consider that such mapping to another space, then the map extends. The map extends to the whole space. That's a non-trivial theorem, which is again instance again proving it not that difficult. But asking such a question at all. And then this property you can ask what are spaces in general having this property with respect to mapping to Rn? And the answer is exactly those which have positive curvature. For example, if you take piece of a convex surface inside of the Euclidean space and with this in internal distance, it has this property. Yeah. Which again, if you just start from scratch, that's not so easy to prove. Yeah? You have to develop the geometry of, this, of the surfaces, starting from the fact that they are convex or that they, when they map to the sphere, the curvature is positive. But so this looks extremely convincing. Yeah, this definition makes it being so nice and logical. And um, it's true for Euclidean space, true for surfaces, and does it give you a consistent class of objects? You start thinking about them and they perfectly. And in the case when you have a Riemannian manifold, in a second I will again discuss Riemannian manifolds from this kind of a naive viewpoint. Mm, what's good about them? This property expressible in terms of the tensorial calculus, positivity of the curvature. And there was much work dedicated to that, but still we have kind of this highly non-trivial theorem, but still there is a big question of the relevance of the whole theory. So mathematicians who know that a yeah, you know, big big developed subject of space of positive curvature, the question is uh, if they are relevant, though they generalize convex convex objects in any dimension you have a convex piece of a convex hypersurface. Intrinsic geometry had this property, so we have a class of examples. So they kind of generalize convex sets, and in many respects we know they look like convex sets. There are quite a few theorems. However, the problem is, and this is often, often happens with mathematical objects, we have very limited ways to generate them. How to generate such objects? I'm not speaking about constructing examples. In certain efforts, we can construct examples here and construct them there. But generate them at least in a way that if you, on one hand, you have the generating mechanism, you generate the surfaces. On the other hand, you have theorems about those spaces. And so, if the situation is such that if you take this theorem and apply it to this object, it still remains a theorem. Right? Because what happens when you take any theorem and apply it to any object in nature to generate, you know this anyway, yeah, in the in generating mechanism. And this happens kind of very, very often in, in what we do. And, uh, you know, this actually generation of mathematical objects, uh, I'll come to this later again, it appears everywhere. For example, this recently I was in a similar kind of a similar meeting in Rome, and I spoke to Mumford, who is now certainly out of algebraic geometry, and I made a bet. He cannot show me more than 10 ways of generating algebraic varieties. He says, oh, immediately I give you a dozen. But he stopped about five or six years. So we say, give an algebraic variety. So just give it to me. I mean, or one from you, one from you, and then immediately you stop. Yeah, you cannot generate them. The convex sets are good in this respect. Yeah, you generate them. You just take hyperplane and the space here, here, and there, and you have it, right? And they're easy to generate. It seems at least easy. Yeah? And then you have to read off from this generation. But <coughs> for this particular instance, unlike convex sets, so you have convex sets, a tremendous pool of examples. But then it essentially stops. So there are some series of examples about which you know everything, essentially coming from Lie groups, and that's it. We just, not just examples, again, you can, with efforts you can make something and produce them. But you cannot generate them. They don't come by themselves, you just don't know what they are. And that's a big question. So you have a beautiful, int intrinsically very rich theory, but what's in there? So, actually this <coughs> kind of grammar describing properties versus generation yeah was kind of very dramatically in, in linguistics maybe you, you heard yeah so before the work of Harris of Chomsky linguistic was concerned with grammars as rules so there are such rules and such rules and such rules so the question there mathematically quite simple you have natural languages they're a string of letters so what mathematically you can say about them what makes a language a language yeah and so what are rules so there are grammars or whatever semantics so you limit possibilities. And I think, well, again, this I'm saying without really knowing the, the, the history. 
And I believe that before Harris and Chomsky, people were concentrated on isolating rules and describing rule after rule after rule. And amazingly, however, that still the rules were very restrictive, the rule of grammar were very restrictive. However, we do know there are lots of sentences we can generate. And then the next question is, what is the generating mechanism? And this is what Chomsky introduced, yeah? So how to create languages out of certain, uh, coming from certain rules. Of course, this is kind of a mathematical scheme, and uh, certainly the more, kind of, I know it's quite more profound, but, yeah, but certainly it's a next level question, how actually a piece of meat can generate the structure. Yeah? So our brain is a piece of meat with no structure at all, yeah? It's certainly extremely primitive, yeah? Evolved by kind of random stupid choice. And then it generates these extremely organized sentences, yeah? And how could it be? Right? And so this, but the generation is there. So there are, in, in the interesting structures we meet, we have both. We have very severe limitations what we can make, yeah? And despite the severe limitations, we have generating mechanism which for some reason ends in this very small space prescribed with limitations. And so I got mathematics when become interesting exactly has the same feature, yeah? have grammar which restricts your possibilities and then there are generating mechanisms. And so, so mathematics are more or less on the side of that you li li limit the rules you are allowed to, what kind of object you may have. For example, we suppose that the theorems which you state and prove must be correct, yeah? which is a common assumption but it's not so clear why we should stick to that. Yeah? So no, no incorrect statements may be in, in some sense much more useful and uh, more relevant, but they might be relevant, yeah, and certainly non-trivially non-correct, yeah, it's, if they come from interesting generation mechanism, so, so we cannot generate them. Now, just, uh, when we I, I, I say about generation, and uh, the same question I was mm, raising before about metric spaces, how we generate metric spaces, so let's come, return back to that, yeah before I enter into negative coverage. So how to generate metric spaces? And then there was this oop, the Riemann conception of a metric. And uh, certainly it has many kind of other features, but just I want to emphasize one, a very simple one, about just generating, generating uh, 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 metrics. And so from what, what you start, you start with a, just, with a quadratic form of three variables. In, in the plane, yeah? And so you have three coefficients A, B, C. Describe me a quadratic form, yeah? So secretly it's x squared, y, x, y, and y squared. And you make them dependent on the point of the plane. So both, all three of them are function in, 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 in three variables. So you have a family of this quadratic form at every point in the plane. You have a quadratic form. I want to think about kind of little ellipse because we say they're positive, positive definite. And that's very easy to write down, right? I can run down some function like, uh, so symbolically you use this notation, this, this replaces x, x squared, and then, so it's a combination of this three, which I, this Leibniz notation, I still, I must say, I cannot take them, yeah. I feel very uncomfortable writing them. And this is the notation of, of Leibniz, and here I put coefficients, so it will be a, b, and c. And this a, b, c are function. Yeah, so what you have, in fact, three functions on the plane, they're easy to generate, and the only condition is being positive definite, which is easy, unlike being metric. So, and this you can write down just at will. And then from that you have a metric. So how you do that? Because at every point you have this little ellipse, yeah, you declare this vector to be union. So given any curve, you know what is the unit size. You can divide into unit pieces and count how many pieces you have, and this is the length of the curve. And then you say, well, given that, you take the shortest curve between two points. And the length of the shortest curve, my metric. By the way, that's easy to say, yeah? What's hard to make to find the shortest curve, by the way, yeah? So this immediately generates a lot of metrics. But the price you pay is very, very implicit. When you say the minimal curve between two points, because if, if I write down the metric by a random taking this function, I know, like e to the x squared plus sine x, da 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 da, da show me this minimal curve, yeah? We can prove it exists, but, but evaluating it's a big mess and it's a big problem. However, you do generate lots and lots and lots of, of, of metrics on the plane or in the Euclidean space. Of course, you can pass to manifold then and say, well, now take a smooth manifold 
right? And you make the definition. And expressions may be may, may, may be pleased when many folders compare. But then, by the way, there is another issue. Yes. Actually, how to generate manifolds, compact manifolds. And if you just look at what happens, you see that we have some very, very few general means of doing that. Yeah? And essentially, the ba basic mechanism, which is sufficiently universal to generate a manifold, is by uh, taking it in slightly generalized sense as levels of smooth function. And you have to take the function generic, which is, a, again, a horrible thing to do because you just cannot precise very well, and taking the level. And that's about it. After given this manifold, you can do many things, yeah? I hate to say the present topology, like surgery, whatever. But this is peanuts compared to the first crea creation act. So this is kind of like a god, yeah? It creates a manifold. And then you can tinker with this, yeah, by something. But you can't create a manifold. So it's extremely difficult also. The mechanism of generating manifolds is not that, that easy. There are some... When I say manifold, I really want it to be just in, in my hands. And the second, they say what it means very much, not, not up to diffeomorphism or whatever, but really just physically manifold in my hands, you manifold. Yeah. And this is the, the, the most powerful general mechanism. Yeah, if you give me a manifold, I write this function, and say, well, I'll take it on a random, and then I have a manifold. But there is nothing else, I believe, in mathematics comparable to that of creating manifolds. Everything is much, much less powerful. I don't know if, again, I want you to, to say I'm saying nonsense, yeah? You just, Okay, so what is your objection? Of course, there are more space. Yeah, this is another source of, of space. Yeah, I, I agree. Modular spaces, yes. With the second man for said that I have a there are modular spaces. Is what up to that? <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course, of course, I agree. Modular space is a very powerful, a very mechanism. Of course, it's, it does something. I'm not saying there aren't. Yeah. I'm saying nothing of that generalist in power. Modular space is a good source of example, absolutely. No question about it. More? I mean... No, 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 but you, just, you, can think, you think you can think of something, but it's not that. It seems to be. It's not so. Modular space in many cases are about absolutely different to find that the space Yes. No, no, no. The modular space is perfect way. I mean, yes, I, I mean, this is one of the most powerful ways to generate mathematical objects as modular spaces. You again emphasized rather recently, but that's one of the points. But so there are these random mechanisms. There are modular spaces. What else? Huh? No, no. Just inside of mathematics, how to generate closed manifolds? Internally, give me twenty ways, different ways, to generate smooth manifolds. No, 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 no. They're not generic. Equations, they're non-generic. That's the whole point. In algebraic geometry, you can say everything given about algebraic equations, but nonsense. If they're generic, you see many If not, it's just words. You, uh, that's the whole point. And the modular spaces don't come this way. They come as extremely kind of a, exactly generating mechanism, which gives you something that's very high order structure. Yeah? It's a perfect example. Yeah, modular spaces, fantastically good example of how we generate objects and with very, very uh, restrictive properties, yeah? And the thing is, just appears everywhere, say, in languages also, they kind of modular space or something, yeah? This is why they exist at all, yeah? And the moduli of, well, we don't know of what, yeah? Of brain states. But, uh, cutting the smooth manifold, so, in, 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 in the end, I, I bring up some question. Yes. 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 No, 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 but, but, but show me a quotient space. There are examples, of course, but there is a systematic way to construct it. This is, by the way, another issue. How to construct equivalent relations? So, of course, of course, of course, that's mine. Come on, this homogeneous example. They just peanuts in the whole world. 
But when you take motion space, you can have equivalent installation in your category. For example, you can say, well, take a smooth manifold, take multiply it by itself, take inside thoughts of manifold, which will be equivalent installation. Just show me that. I, I, I actually come, I, 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 I will go into convince you this way that even compact spaces don't exist, yeah? Because if you, they can be defined this way, but unbelievable they exist. Because you can make equivalent installation in the category. And this is typically extremely difficult. It takes take, take you out of category, give you kind of your kind of spaces like foliation. It doesn't give you many forms. Yeah, they are like modular spaces. They're usually not manifold, yeah. They're usually not manifold. They're spaces, but typically they're not manifold. They do develop singularities, but the way they just force on you, yeah. I'm saying specifically here about manifolds, not general spaces. So, manifolds are, and maybe, you know, I'm wrong, I thought about this for a while and just was surprised to see that there are so few, so, so few uh, generating mechanisms for manifolds. Okay. But anyway, we do have this Lots and lots of Riemannian metrics we can generate but by this process and some time enclosed manifold as well. But there is absolutely no way to generate them in this category. Yeah? And so this is a big question. If there is some differential geometric framework, maybe not that, but somewhat different, which includes convex sets, but in the context of general metric spaces or Riemannian manifold or whatever, if you can truly generalize convexity. Yeah, in this naive way. Of course, there are completely different avenues like pseudo-convexity and complex geometry, which is in, well, in much better than convexity, but it's another you know, issue. It goes, you takes you away from naive intuition. OK, so, and then, of course, the, the, the issue which um, appears here, so again, even if you in this limited category, what are the questions people you may or may not ask? and. Uh, so I want to emphasize the wrong kind of question. It might be the wrong kind of question to ask and answer, though I myself was involved much in doing that. Just relating topology, topology of the space to, to its geometry, right? So given certain topological type, if it admits a metric of positive coverage. Yeah, and this is a, in my opinion, very stupid question, though you can sometimes answer it, yeah? Because you mix the structures in, a, in, in the wrong way. So maybe here make some little diversion because recently I learned of some question which came actually from, from physics and it indicates how basically we don't understand topology. Huh? Before I go to negative curvature, yeah? where the situation is more uh, satisfactory. So this question exactly related to this of generation manifold. So let's try to generate manifolds by triangulating them. So we just can see the manifolds which are triangulated into simplices. And when you triangulate manifold into simplices, say a fixed dimension k of your manifold, you triangulate it into n simplices. So how many such triangulations are there? And just simple computation shows, regardless of k, the number of possible triangulations will be of order n factorial. Whether they're manifolds or not, or complex, we have about n factorial different simplicial complex with n simplices. But now, let's consider among them those, so it is space, x, and triangulation, which are homeomorphic to a given space. So you restrict their topology. And then there is a conjecture that their number, number of such, is bounded by some constant to the power n. So it becomes by, by far less, from n factorial, you drop to exponential. And, uh, well, for all I understand, it's still unknown, though there are books by physicists who just prove it and use it, whatever, but I don't think there are, there are actually proofs. And uh, so it tells you that we're just looking at the space given to you, so it's triangulating in one way of generating manifold. You triangulate something and say, well, that's this my, my, my axiom. But the question is what actually tells you, just even in the very coarse, the coarsest possible way, you don't know how much topology restricts, ge well, here geometry is just triangulation, it's kind of a geometry. And then you just say, well, forced topology. And this seems to be highly incompatible, they just, to match a given topology by geometry, it's an impossible question. 
I think it's, for, well, I, I, I learned about this other recently, I think it's a fantastic question, yeah. I, I don't know, simply a question in topology, as you can imagine, and it was never asked by topologists. And if you think about that, you realize that it's uh, how little you understand about this matter. For physicists, I don't quite understand, of course, the relevance of this, yeah? It is relevant, yeah? No, but still, it's just very coarse. Yeah, I want to know there is some limit and there is an term. And yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay, so, so much for convexity in this question. So, and now in other aspects. So I was speaking, the problem we have is the generalized convexity. What about this opposite thing, hyperbolicity? Yeah? And this, of course, emerged much later, understanding of this hyperbolic thing. Yeah, so Gauss was you know, in, 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 in hyperbolic geometry, and then it was done by Lobachevsky, who invented it somewhat later. And do you know why he did it later? Because they have the same mathematics teacher. First he was teaching Gauss, then he went to Rush to Kazan and was teaching Lubachevsky. <laughs> it was the same man, yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it's not a joke. He was a mathematician. He's not known by his name, but he was apparently a fantastic fellow. I forgot his name. When I was in Kazan, they gave me the name. I never heard it, so I forgot it. I don't remember the name. But he's a German scientist, and apparently he was an extremely brilliant man. And he probably was asking this question to his students, yeah? <laughs> and apparently what stopped Gauss from pu publishing his work, and this I believe it was kind of a, uh, well, maybe he understood something, you don't see that, what he couldn't do, yeah, he couldn't find model in the three space, yeah, so there's partial spaces, of course the negative curvature in three space, but you cannot extend it, and he couldn't extend them, and for good reason it's kind of impossible, so he cannot find the surface of course, the negative in three space, and uh, he would never look for high dimensional spaces where still is extremely hard to find it. But certainly, it's very easy to find it in the Lorentz space. Yeah. In the Lorentz space, the unisphere is just that, and certainly it was out of the imagination of, of, of that. So, there is this hyperbolic geometry, there is the whole thing coming from this whole idea of hyperbolicity, both in geometry and dynamical system. Well, I don't want cannot discuss it much, but um, here situation is, yeah, by the way, when I was speaking about this definition, one very attractive feature, this will appear also in hyperbolicity, it's in fact, it's kind of, kind of easy to verify, it's kind of loop because it's local. So if property, if you remember what I say, that any ellipses distance decreasing perhaps extends from bigger set to smaller set, is a local property. If you have a space, where this condition is locally satisfied, then it's globally satisfied, okay. which is not at all obvious. A given a space where we can cover it by tiny little sets, and on each of them, this is being true, then it's true in, in, in the whole. Yeah. And this, of course, one thing geometers love so much. Yeah? You want to start from something local, and this very property then tells you the same thing globally. Not just something, but exactly the same thing. Yeah? And there are not so many uh, concepts with this, with, this, with this feature, yeah? That locality just becomes global, become global but, but without changing in shape. And so hyperbolicity can be uh, actually characterized in a similar way, in a seemingly similar way. Namely, there we are speaking about maps from X to the Euclidean space, and when we speak about negative curvature, on the contrary, we map Euclidean spaces into our space. And just the same, just for any distance decreasing, distance decreasing um, map from a subset extend to the bigger space in the Euclidean space. So it's completely symmetric. And also, local implies global, provided, and this is a little kind of provision, this space is simply connected. And so it may look kind of disturbing. But on the contrary, it opens 
kind of the, the really interesting po po possibilities. So again, negative curvature means that any distance decreasing map from a subset of Rn extends to the whole Rn when you map into the space. And if it's true locally for domain in the space, it, it, it holds true for the whole space, provided this global space is simply connected. Yeah. So, <clears throat> and then you can say, and up to some extent, yeah, in the all the all the development of negative curvature, though is different definition. Well, you have space of negative curvature, yes, and then while well, determined essentially by its universal covering and becomes really having this feature. So there is fundamental group, and so the study of that reduced to algebra. Just uh, remember this statement written, which is absolute nonsense, yeah? Because there is no algebra of groups. And just again, if you look at the definition of a group, especially yes, the one given by presentation, yeah? There is very limited theory there, yeah? Just again, group like other mathematical object, you give a definition, and then you ask what are generating mechanisms. And then, of course, there are groups coming from particular structures. So here it's very different from manifold, yeah? There are lots and lots of different structures which just give you groups. Essentially, they have modular spaces, the automorphism of certain structures. And so, but they, like, Galois group, yeah? But certainly it's not a group, yeah? I mean, it's something very, 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 also a group, but much more. But <laughs> internally in the group theory, the basic mechanism of generating groups is having generators in the relation. So it's, again, it's very simple to say and, uh, well, you have just, oh, wait, symbolically, you have your symbolic generators and you have sim relations which are words in the generator. So it's just a bunch of words in a given alphabet. So you write words, say, in, in, in English alphabet and this gives you a group, yeah? Just take Shakespeare, it gives you a group. But the, the problem is, if this group is, what, what is this group? And typically it will be trivial. If you just do it, too many words, yeah, and things collapse. You know? So it must, be, it must keep balance. And the, the best known mechanism to, to control it comes from, amazingly from negative curvature. So these groups which we understand, which we can generate, well, I don't, don't, don't have a chance to explain this, of course, but it actually comes, comes from negative curvature. So it's, it's one domain where this negative curvature enters and shapes it and explains it. And basically, one of the reasons exactly this is that local implies global. But there, local versus global of, of different nature. In positive curvature, yeah, the objects, roughly speaking, to satisfy this equation, yeah, this equals minus y. And so what you have, you have this sign, and this rather unstable phenomenon. If you perturb a little bit the equation, you lose this simple oscillating behavior, yeah, it may be like grow, etc. yeah, completely out of control. That's kind of phenomenal dynamical system, very kind of elliptic periodic point. But hyperbolistic response to exponential growth, you have exponent growing there, and this, you know, exponents are very robust. If an, a, 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 you knew at every step you're doubling, you go double. Imagine you changed a little bit, yeah, you don't double, but sometimes triple, sometimes one, they have, you still grow the same way, yeah, and that's the essence of hyperbolicity or exponential growth and actually exponential function is another source of good questions so but that's it's not at all clear from these two definitions one they turn this way so positive curvature limits you and if you and that's psychologically when people are divided into categories you love to be restricted to something nice and pretty and cozy and kind of convexity positive curvature in this little room yeah and it's very small, but well, you can study it in great detail. Or on the contrary, you have a hyperbolic. You go to infinity the exponential rate, and then you just still want to know what happens. And, and of course, in the dynamical system, yeah, it's the same kind of phenomenon. So hyperbolicity is persistent phenomenon. And both in geometry and the dynamical system, in most cases, you don't have pure hyperbolicity. It's just mixed with something else, like this convexity. However, it's dominant, yeah. And again, uh, uh, when we say that in, 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 in general dynamical systems, you know, you're actually not here, so you want some, somebody to object, yeah? You don't object, yeah? Okay, good. Yeah. And the only class of system we may hope to understand where there is, by, by 
shape is given by hyperbolicity, though it's not pure hyperbolicity. Uh, and the same is true about group theory, which uh, I cannot explain. Okay, so this is this I was, I was supposing to, to mean to be non-speculative part of my lecture. Yeah. <laughs> now, where uh, we start kind of speculating, so I'll just I, I, I show the kind of example of a simple question how it developed, and then we just we just want to well this also ask questions. So Gauss asked this question, and that gave us good development. So we are not that smart, but still, how to ask questions? So you. You, 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 in a very simple domain, you just have your objects, you just take your simple mathematical laws. See, in geometry, I, I emphasize kind of extremely a visual kind of situation, which we do know. We don't have to know mathematics to ask the question. But how to isolate it from, from kind of a, from possibilities? So, unfortunately, Arnold is not here because he had this conception of how to call multi mathematics or poly mathematics, yeah? It's some, some way you have something here, you move it there, and just how you generate questions out of, out of anything. Of course, if you just do it by wheel, you don't expect really good questions, but even bad question I would appreciate. Yeah? Just how to make a bad question, but not obviously trivial. And, uh, and, and where, so we look. Again, I don't really mean profound questions, yeah? which kind of border with conjectures, yeah? but I mean just very simple-minded questions. You see something and just, well, there's a certain pattern in that. And um, so some of them may come, of course, internally mathematically. So let me, so now I will say something I was thinking recently myself, some way of generating, of generating objects and therefore asking questions about them. So, so, so one thing is just, you just find some generating mechanism for objects, maybe not especially bright, but ask questions or you look around you just in a, in a, in a really visual, you just look around and see what you see and just w about what you make, make a meaningful, meaningful question. So <coughs> maybe I, I can start from the second part, yeah? Because recently I, I talked much with biologists, say, and with chemists. And uh, so, and they do have their kind of questions, and which leads to, to mathematical questions. For example, if you look at plants or trees, yeah? So can you say as a mathematician what they are? So a piece of a surface, yeah, is kind of, this we understand, yeah? Now it looks something like trees. So, and so what you have here is also just exactly these two features. So on one hand, there is a very peculiar structure there, yeah? You just, they're not at all anything, yeah? You have a tree, and there are leaves, and there are branches, and they can organize in a certain way. You immediately recognize it. Yeah. This, by the way, another way how you recognize it. Again, it was a piece of meat, something almost without structure, which can tell instantaneously tree from an animal. Right? That's, by the way, well, this psychologist of vision work on that. Yeah, and it's, it's extremely unclear in principle, in principle, how this could happen. Yeah? Not just in detail, but in principle, it's impossible. Yes, if you start thinking a little bit about that, how it could work, it just cannot work. We know that our response to the nervous system is very, very slow. Yeah, it's just, uh, just well, tens of milliseconds. And the uh, difference between a tree and an uh, animal just so. You, you, you try to describe it in short words, you see it's impossible. Yeah. So, but however, we see something there. Like animals, they don't have this issue of shape, but they speak about trees or vegetation in general, right? You see here, there's definitely some regularity in this pattern. How to describe them? And indeed, there was discovered a generating mechanism for them, describing them up to some extent, the framework is a fractal, fractal framework, up to some extent, but not in the limit. But um, there was a ma mathematical mechanism discovered by, uh, what's his name? Uh, oh, shit, I forgot. It's, they're called L systems, yeah, but so the name is Lindemeyer, yeah. I'm not talking about spelling. He was a biologist. He was kind of, for a while, he was a classical biologist and doing like, molecular biology. And then he switched to generating mathematical making of plants and immediately lost his job, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and now he became very famous uh, in, this is in computer science, especially the systems are used. So that is a mathematical generating mechanism 
for plants and is extremely close to what is called mass of partitions in the dynamical system. So it's a hyperbolic mechanism, but it's a particular, it's kind of generating trees, a simple object that is more to that. So there are some generating mechanisms which roughly give you the idea of that, but certainly they are by, by, no means, by no means sufficient. So the mathematical question may ask what a simple mechanism Principle, they might be extremely simple, they're coded in very few words, which generates, however, the variety of, of, of vegetable form. Because there we have, on one hand, large variety, on the other hand, it's very, very structurally organized. It's more interesting than, than the, uh, what we have in the animal world. Actually, in the animal world, we also have it, but we don't see it, yeah? So if you look inside you, then you do have some trees, yeah? For example, the uh, the system of blood vessels, yeah, it also makes a tree. And it's an extremely beautiful tree, and just uh, recently there was a lecture in the Statistical Mechanical Conference by somebody, Geoffrey West, who used this to explain some bi biological regularities. Looking at this huge tree, you know, it goes on in miles, yeah, in length, because there are microscopic trees, it branches and branches. Actually, it doesn't branch too much, five or six times only. But still has a lot, six is a lot, yeah, you know, this exponential function. And um, so there you may find dramatically attractive, attractive, attractive structures about which you may, you may think. So another, of course, again, back in the biology is the, the possible combinatorial arrangements of the brain connections, yeah, which allows you say, to tell, to tell uh, an animal from a plant. And again, it's a very primitive mechanism. And uh, there are some non-trivial non kind of mathematical models there. For example, if you want to explain the following phenomenon, kind of from scratch, not really biologically, but as a mathematician, that we know so fast we don't know something. For example, if you ask the telephone number of the Bill Clinton, everybody knows or doesn't know it. How can you do it without searching your memory? <laughs> right? <laughs> don't have to, I don't know of this, of this, like computer will die, of this, of this, not, not this, not here. Uh, Ah, it was 45 minutes. Uh, I think you were yeah. no Ah, no, I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then just to say a couple of words about, <laughs> about Bill Clinton and that's yeah. it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't know, you don't know, you don't know his, uh, his uh, telephone number. And there is a very beautiful mechanism due to uh, Canerva. It's a, it's a computer scientist who gave a very beautiful kind of formal scheme of a memory, of iterative memory, and where the key point of that, how it works, is the concentration phenomenon. So I'll stop at this, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> it's concentration phenomenon. <laughs>